We were looking again last week, and we will be doing the same tonight at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, so we want to go back and read these verses again. couple of weeks, not because it was so important historically, although of course it certainly was, but because it's so typical of what has been reenacted in the stage of history time and time again since Genesis 11, it was very important historically uh, for some of the changes that, well, we don't get to until down in verses 8 and 9. I mean, just the building of a city, nothing so great about that, but it was all of the intent and design behind what they did that make this an important historical event, but extremely important for us today because of, as I say, the typical application that we have. So back to verse 1, speaking of the unity, and of course we know that verse 1 He's introducing the Tower of Babel with verse 1 because this is the primary thing that's going to change here in chapter 11 uh, is the language of the people. So this is why he introduces the chapter in this manner. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So, obviously, as we have taught you Acts 17.26, the unity of the human race implies the unity of the language of the human race as long as you're prior to the results of Genesis 11. So the whole earth was one language, one speech. By the way, it wasn't Hebrew like most people want to make it. They want to make Hebrew somehow the sacred language that God taught Adam. But Hebrew, according to the Old Testament, is called the lip of Canaan. And since Adam was created evidently somewhere over in Babylon, he certainly didn't speak, speak the lip of Canaan. It was the language that they learned the Israelites later on. So what the language was, of course, I mean, we could all sit here and theorize on what it is, and we would all be just as far away as each other would be from what it would be. We have no idea of knowing what it was. But it certainly wasn't English or French or Spanish or anything like that. It wasn't even Hebrew. We don't know what it was. But it wasn't some type of special heavenly language because you say, well, God taught it right to Adam. That's true, but all of the perverse and wicked men after Adam spoke the same language. Genesis 11, 1, the earth was one language and one speech. Even Nimrod spoke the same thing. So couldn't have been Latin. Only holy people speak Latin. There couldn't have been a lot of other things. Only holy people. You know, certain languages are associated with holy people or a holy language, but there is no holy language except Acts 2-4 language, and that's Amen. the language of the Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 And that might end up being Yiddish or Turkish, but <laughs> it's spoken by the Spirit, and that's what makes it a blessed, sacred language. Because many people end up speaking in tongues in Latin or French or whatever. But when you've never learned the language, that's, that's a little bit different. I could say a lot different. <laughs> Verse 2, And it came to pass as they journeyed toward the east, remember, not from the east, they have to be going toward the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. We don't just rewrite our Bibles in case anyone's wondering why we insert things. <laughs> God didn't reveal the Bible in King James English language. So there might be a thing or two that needs to be changed in the King James Version as well as in any other version. So it came to pass as they journeyed toward the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Shinar, remember, is the ancient name for the level part of Babylonia. <clears throat> Most of Babylonia is level, but you get outside of the river valley there and it's not too level becomes rather hilly. And they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. They had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So we had only gotten through these four verses. 
They had, remember, a twofold design and plan in mind, and that was to build the city and the tower, several purposes, all of which are included here in verse 4, behind the building of the city and the tower. And if you remember, we gave you one of the views about the tower, since the word here is the old word migdal for tower that generally refers to a watchtower, whether it be on a city or at a mountain pass or perhaps in an olive grove or vineyard. It's the same type of tower for the same purpose, and that is to watch out for one's enemies, whether they be enemies that would attack the city or enemies that would take away the produce of one's land. That's not what's meant here. Something a little more spectacular is meant by the word tower, even though it happens to be referred to as a migdal. Now, another view that I didn't give you concerning this tower is allegedly backed up by some verses over in Deuteronomy. Remember that we're talking about the Tower of Babel, but the tower's not called Babel. The city's called Babel. The tower's called a ziggurat, as we would know it today. So when we say the Tower of Babel, it's not a name, it's possession, the tower that belonged to the city of Babel. But most people, if you ask them what was the name of the tower, they'd say Babel because that's the general way that we refer to this tower is the Tower of Babel, and so they think that it means that the name of the tower is Babel. But in Deuteronomy, for instance, Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 and 2, another view that wants to take away the originality and uniqueness of the tower of Nimrod and his comrades in Genesis 11 thus really taking away all of the significance of these nine verses, is what we might call the figurative view, not the watchtower view, but the figurative view, where it says that they built a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Well, it means that like Deuteronomy 9, verse 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakim, whom thou knowest and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? And then in chapter 1 and verse 28 of Deuteronomy, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Now, it doesn't mention towers here, but, of course, towers are included. It mentions cities because that's what the children of Israel had to conquer and overcome. But, of course, he's simply writing figuratively here. They didn't have towers built all the way up to heaven or cities with walls built up to heaven or cities with towers whose top represented heaven. It's simply a figurative way of saying they had cities which had walls that were practically insurmountable. You couldn't go over them. They were so tall. Take, for instance, uh, Jericho. Of course, they couldn't get over those walls, so, of course, they had another remedy. They brought the walls down to them. Amen. rather than them trying to go over the walls. And archaeology has proven on some of these ancient cities, well, you could even take the city of Jerusalem, that the wall may be, you know, 40 feet high and 20 feet thick. And it's built down in the ground so you can't tunnel underneath the thing. So these forts they came on weren't just that. They were tremendous fortifications that you couldn't go under, you couldn't go through, and you certainly couldn't go over. So the only hope you had is God delivering the city into your hands, which is what happens. Uh, Joshua chapter 6 with Jericho. But it's a figurative representation of the fact that the cities were practically impregnable. Without divine assistance, no doubt most of them were impregnable when you've got a motley group of 3 million Israelites, 600,000 fighting men who had been slaves for 400 years. Now what hope do you think they could possibly have defeating people like the Amorites and the Canaanites, all the ites in the land of Palestine. So that's one part of the whole miracle of the thing. 
what's the group of, and people say, well, just the sheer number, 600,000 men going to overcome Jericho with maybe a few thousand in it, or the city of Ai with maybe a few thousand, 12,000 in Ai and Bethel they got in chapters 7 and 8 of Joshua. But it doesn't matter how many men, 600,000 or 6,000, how are you going to go through that wall? I mean, you could take turns butting your head up against it, and you'd probably go through all 600,000 before you made the first dent in a wall like that. Yes, we know people of that day used battering rams and so forth, but the Israelites didn't. They weren't allowed to use things like that. They were told to trust in the Lord, and he would deliver their enemies into their hands. As a matter of fact, most of the time, it's always put in the past tense. Joshua, go ahead and fight because I have delivered your enemies into your hands. That was said about Jericho. Jericho has been delivered. And not an arrow had been shot yet. And yet God said Jericho has been delivered. And this was true with all the cities. That was part of the miracle of her conquest of Palestine. No, the sheer numbers couldn't overcome those great cities any more than a handful could. It was going to take, on their behalf, divine intervention. So anyway, Genesis 11, no, this is not a figurative representation. See, if you go back here to verse 4, and you interpret this in light of Deuteronomy, then you get just a great big city with maybe a great big tower on it, similar on the same fashion and perhaps by the same design as we'd find, of course, many years later, other Near Eastern cities. But... Our problem with that, and I have not yet understood why the commentators don't see this, is it strikes off the books immediately the originality of these nine verses. Why give the nine verses when we're going to read all about it over in Joshua? I mean, the whole book, the whole first 12 chapters of Joshua tell us all about great cities and things. Why give us nine verses way back here? It takes out the uniqueness and the originality of the material that we have. So as we said, the may reach is not in the Hebrew. Simply said that this tower had a top that was in heaven. And of course, we again don't think that it reached God's heaven, and we're not to think that. It reached heaven as far as they were concerned. And they established heaven. They're on the top of it. We went through most of this last week. With their occult shrine that they had worshiping the religion of astrology. Let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So we'd gotten that far. Now verses 5 and 6 give us God's reaction to their building project, which is not favorable. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Again, misinterpretations and misunderstandings in these two verses. Verse 5 is given to us in the typical Old Testament manner of anthropomorphic language when it speaks of God coming down to see the city and the tower. Now, in anthropomorphic language, that means that we don't have, for instance, what we have in chapter 18, if you'll turn there. It's speaking anthropomorphically of God coming down to see. Does God ever come down? Well, he certainly does sometimes. Genesis 18 gives us, well, the whole chapter about a time when God manifested himself in a physical form out of heaven on the earth to the patriarch Abraham. Now, this is not what's happening back there in chapter 11. That's why we have to draw the distinction. Notice verse 1, And the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the oaks, the word shouldn't be plains, but the oaks of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So here we've got an actual, literal, physical 
Now, by physical, I don't mean in mortal flesh, but nevertheless a physical, visible representation of God coming down from heaven, manifesting himself to Abraham. Uh, down to verse uh, 22. The men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So it must be the Lord who's actually standing here by him. And then down in verse 33. And then the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. So God was in one place and he went another place. We're not going to get into what all that means, but it's safe to say that what we have here is a physical, visible representation of God that's entirely on a different order than what we have in Genesis chapter 11. Now, to just give you another passage, we could multiply the passages, but over in, let's see, the book of Judges, for instance, we have another case where something similar is taking place in the 13th chapter. And it's very obvious here that somehow God's coming down and then going back up again. Verse 3, Judges 13. The angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Then the angel of the Lord, of course, departs, and Manoah's wife, relates this to Manoah, and he wants to see the Lord again, and so the Lord appears again. Uh, then the appearance is recorded down in verses 15 uh, through 20. And so in verse 20, and it came to pass after they're making this offering here, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. In other words, the angel had come down out of heaven. That's, of course, a manifestation of God in the angel of the covenant. And as the flame is going back to heaven, then the angel of the Lord goes back to heaven. And, of course, many times the best example is found when the cloud, the cloudy pillar descends upon the tabernacle, the tent of the meeting with the time of Moses and Joshua, and it says that God actually descended in the cloud and then spoke unto Moses whenever he was at the door of the tent of the meeting. That's not just uh, anthropomorphic language. That is God actually coming down. But back here in Genesis 11 and verse 5, when it speaks of God coming down to see the city and the tower, it simply means he looked down. He's not coming down physically or visibly here. It's speaking anthropomorphically. So he's not coming down visibly. He's simply looking down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. If you look over in Psalm 33, there are a couple of cases in the Psalms where well, one of these especially, it appears that the writer of the Psalms probably had Genesis 11 and verse 5 in mind. Psalm 33, verse 13 through 15. The Lord looked from heaven, and he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all of their works. But then in chapter 14, the first three verses, the reference here in chapter 14 of the book of Psalms, verses 1 to 3, is so clear and graphic. No doubt the author, David, probably had in mind, typically speaking, what he knew to have been recorded by Moses in Genesis 11. When he says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and see God. Amen. Now, since Genesis 11, of course, came before Psalm 14, the writer of Psalm 14 would have Genesis 11 in mind and not vice versa. 
The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of God, no, the children of men, because they've all forsaken the Lord, to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Probably he's got it in mind because the very similar language is used in Genesis 11 when he says that the Lord looked down to see the city and to see the tower. Well, he's looking really at the men and at what they're doing. He goes on to say that in verse 6 and verse 7, by the way. He's looking at what they're doing. He's really not too concerned about a literal city and tower. But what are they doing with that city and tower? Well, he says his summary of what they are like is in verse 3. They are all gone aside. So probably Noah's not alive anymore. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Amen. Then he calls them workers of iniquity, which don't have any knowledge. Oh, they have some occult knowledge, but not knowledge of the true God and of true religion. So he's probably referring back to Genesis 11 when he says that the Lord looked down upon the children of men. And in Psalm 33, the writer tells us that God is always looking down upon the children of men. And again, we know that he doesn't always descend, but he is always looking over the balcony of heaven just to see what man is busy doing down here. And he found him in that day busy building a city, building a tower. He finds man busy today doing what? Well, man doesn't ever change. Man's busy doing the same thing, building a city and building a tower. So man doesn't change. He's doing the same thing, and God's still looking down, and he's still asking the same question. Is there anyone down there that understands? That's what he's asking there in Psalm 14. He looked down to see if any understood. The implication is no, none are understanding. Oh, a few, but they got it by God's grace, so they don't deserve anything anyway. <laughs> so is anyone understanding? No. God's the only one that understands. He understands all things. And he just, of course, allows us to understand some things. There are not very many people, dear friends, out there that understand anything. I mean anything at all. And especially when it comes to religion. Oh, everyone likes to think they're an authority on religion. But... Psalm 14, I believe, is true for today. There's none that understands. Amen. There's none that's doing any good in God's eyes. That's right. Guess what, though? They're busy doing a lot of work, Amen. just like old Nimrod and his rebellious comrades were, building religious edifices. And then after they get it built, gotten it built, they ask God's blessing upon the stained glass windows of their religious edifice that they have built. You said it. Man is still busy building cities and building towers. We're just going to have to stay away from people who build cities and build towers and then claim to be of God. And join, as we said, what this implies here is the union of a religious empire upon a political empire. The political empire comes first, and then you join your religious empire to that. And I rem I'm reminded of John chapter 18 that you might want to look at just to remind you of what Jesus had to say about people who want to stir in religion and politics and politics and religion. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Amen. And why, then we have to ask the question, why are people trying to build God's kingdom for him here in this world? He says, my kingdom's not of this world. <laughs> he told them the kingdom of God is within you. That's where the kingdom is. Amen. You're supposed to be building and laying up treasures, Matthew 6, there. Not building these steeples and edifices and huge architectural miracles. I mean, some of them are practically miracles. You just... And hardly imagine how they ever got the thing built. Amen. Of course, it was with loss of a lot of life and sleep and money and so forth. Amen. But uh, a gaining of a lot of pride and recognition, though. Isn't that just like old carnal man? He's willing to lose money, lose time, lose life, lose sleep to gain pride and to gain recognition. Right. 
that was one of the purposes they were building this back in chapter 11 was to gain worldly recognition in the world. And if you don't have a city or a tower today and you're a religious denomination, you're just not doing anything for God. So we're told. Where's your headquarters? How big is your church? <laughs> they always want to know things like that. Amen. If you don't have a structure like that, then you're not doing anything for God. And no one's interested in you meeting in that little despised group, cave, hut, underground, wherever it is that you meet, meeting in someone's attic, meeting out in the straw in the barn. What do you do in the straw in that barn out there? The lights are dim in there. There's a lot of noise. Sometimes it gets real quiet. As if they've never experienced what quietness is like. If you've been in your church, you know what quietness is like. <laughs> it's a different type of quietness when the anointing is there rather than when boredom is there and you're so <laughs> bored you have to be quiet or either shuffle around and then get the deacons throwing you out of church because you make too much noise yeah. i literally dear friends got so bored i carried little cowboys and indians and fought with them right in the pew second pew from the front i still remember exactly where i sat <laughs> I can imagine, well, I really can't because uh, people don't do that around here. They're more interested in the word. What that poor pastor thought. I see people out there either sleeping or fighting. with. <laughs> I'm not really concerned to tell you the truth what he thought because he never said anything worth giving any consideration about. Remember, he was our Christian magician that worked magic tricks for us. Now, I watched whenever he did that. That was interesting. And I guess they had been taught in seminary to do that at the beginning, to get everyone's attention. And it got our attention, but we were bright enough to know that as soon as he got through with that, he was going to go back talking about old poor adult dry doctrine. And so we would just, of course, close our ears after the little magic trick that was done. Well, anyway, what I'm saying is Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, so I'm not too concerned about building any type of political or religious or any type of empire here. Everyone's out to build a kingdom for themselves. I mean, every denomination and religious group and church and false ministry and some that call themselves a true ministry is out to build a kingdom for themselves. Now, that can be proven in a hundred ways I don't want to get into now because it would get too far off the subject further than we already are. We're really not off the subject. The subject is mixing the politics and the religion here together. But all of these ministries out there, they want recognition from the world. That's why they try to be good friends with people that are in charge of government locally there. And the Bible says that we ought to pray for local government officials as well as other government officials, but not invite them over to our house for a social dinner together. And a lot of them do that and boast about the fact that they've met the president and they've got a picture of the president with his arm around them. I'm thinking of several instances now where they're trying to sell books on the base of the fact that the author of that edition has his picture in there with the president along with it. Likes all of the recognition that the world has to offer. And the true church ever since Jesus established it has always been in the minority, not majority, and has always been despised and has always been persecuted. I don't know about you, but it gives me a safe feeling whenever we're persecuted around here. Because the church has always been a persecuted group of people. And when the church, I'm talking about the true church, when the church is suffering persecution, it simply draws them closer to one another and closer to their Lord and Savior. Because when you've got no persecution, but you're accepted by the world and you accept the world, then you have no need of God then. You are self-sufficient in yourself. And if you run out of funds, you've always got many, many faith prayer partners that will help supply your needs for you. Never think of the fact that if God told them to do what they're doing, then God would supply the finances for it. And it's proof of the fact he didn't tell them because he's not supplying for them. They're having to beg and plead and ask man to supply for them. And that's proof of the fact God's never called them to do what most of them are doing. 
You'll only find a handful. I mean, you take someone like George Mueller, just a handful of people who never told anyone about their needs, but who actually did something for the Lord. As a matter of fact, George Mueller's work is still going on today, probably not as strong as when Mr. Mueller was here over a hundred years ago, and not perhaps with the same vein of true faith, but from what I hear, still faith and trusting the Lord for their finances. But you won't find any ministries like that today. It was proof of the fact in the first century, and it's proof of the fact today that if God has called you to do what you're doing, then the least of his problems, if he had any, which he doesn't, would be to meet the financial need of whatever he's called you to do. Why call you to do something and leave you out on a limb bankrupt? Amen. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Well, re religion doesn't make a lot of sense, and it doesn't have to, <laughs> because it's the opium of the masses, as Mr. Mark said, and since you're already on the thing, on the drug, you're already sedated anyway, you don't know that what you're being taught doesn't make any sense. How many of us ever thought back in the denominations that what we were learning didn't make any sense? I mean, you're a rare individual. I sat back there and, and never really thought about it. Of course, I closed my ears most of the time to what was said. But we sit there in the pews all the time and never give any thought to the fact that what we're being taught doesn't make a lot of sense. If we ever did, I mean, some of us, all of us did sooner or later. That's how we got out of it and got into where we are now. Just why didn't we think of it earlier? We all had to come to that place sooner or later to think, my word, what's being said here doesn't make any sense at all. It's just a lot of hocus-pocus mumbo-jumbo that doesn't make any sense. A lot of religiosity, as far as I'm concerned. Amen. For the of it earlier. <laughs> we all had to come to that place sooner or later to think, my word, what's being said here doesn't make any sense at all. It's just a lot of hocus-pocus mumbo-jumbo that doesn't make any sense. A lot of religiosity, as far as I'm concerned. Amen. So in verse 5, we have the anthropomorphic language and technique being used of God coming down. Now, verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now, I guess the popular misconception here is the fact that in verse 6, what people read into it is that God is afraid of the people and their great tower that perhaps they're actually going to reach heaven, climb right over the banister, and somehow get into the kingdom. Because what does it mean here where it says that they're all one language, they've begun to do one deed now, and nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do? Well, he's speaking really more in the area of their occult involvement. He realizes that now they've received, of course, direct occult involvement. And though according to chapter 8 and verse 21 of Genesis, he recognized after the flood, of course, he knew all along, but he states in 821 after the flood that he knows man's wicked from the day he's born until the day he dies. He knows man is perverse and wicked. But this unity of purpose that they have, chapter 11, verse 1, along with the occult knowledge and revelation, false religious revelation, verse 4, that they've been given, no doubt, should God allow this to continue, he's going to have to come right along and destroy the world all over again. You see, he can't allow this conglomerate of occult knowledge and paganism and rebellion gather together in this one place for a very long period of time or it's going to corrupt the whole earth. And so this is what he means when he says that now nothing will be restrained from them. Well, they're not going to actually make it to heaven or pull God off the throne or anything like that. But the combination of their purpose of unity and their occult revelation that they have is going to make the men so wicked and so perverse that should God not intervene, he's going to have to destroy the world all over again. And, of course, he had already promised he wouldn't do that, not until the last time when he destroys and makes 2 Peter 3.13, Revelation 21, verse 1, Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, four times in Scripture, a new heavens and a new earth. 
He's not going to destroy this earth until it's time to make that new earth. He's already said that. So rather than destroy the earth, he's going to intervene for the third time personally in history, contrary to the English deistic view of God that he has made a creation and once he finished making it, he pretty much left it to its own to see what it would do. No, God has always been very involved with his creation. And I said now for the third time he becomes directly involved. First of all, that was Genesis 3 with redemption. Think if God had not come down and slain those animals and covered the sin symbolically with the blood of the animal of Adam and Eve and given them rather than the works religion garment made out of vegetables, leaves that they had upon them, rather than that, he gave them animal skins. Think what would have happened to the human race. Been no salvation at all. All men would have been lost up until the time of Jesus Christ. But that means all people, Noah, Abraham, all of them would have been lost if God had not intervened by means of redemption. Of course, the second case is the flood. Here he's doing it really for man's benefit. He's destroying the world for man's benefit. You say, well, how does that benefit? Well, he preserved righteousness. And, of course, it was his intention that righteousness should spring from Noah. And like chapter 4 in verse, I believe, 21, at least the end of chapter 4 of Genesis, that men would again begin to call upon the name of the Lord. That doesn't happen... You see, it's just a whole series of events here. God left Adam and Eve there to do what he had told them to do. They make their blunder, and he has to intervene to save them. And so you'd think that, well, their posterity would get the matter in a hurry, settle in their heart to obey God. No, the first son, Cain, becomes a murderer. And then sin just multiplies and reproduces itself after its kind in all of the people of the earth. And pretty soon the whole world is filled with nothing but wickedness. That's Genesis chapter 6, where we read there earlier in verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Nothing but wickedness, so he intervenes for the second time in the affairs and history of this creation that he has by destroying the earth, preserving righteous Noah. After that, what happens? Well, Noah dies off, and by chapter 11, we're right back to chapter 6 again. That's just the state of mankind. We're right back to chapter 6 again, where all men are wicked and forsaking the Lord. He enters into the affairs of men again by what he does here in verses 7, 8, and 9, which we'll look at here in a moment. And, of course, history goes on. We get down to the time of Abraham. Evidently, man has become wicked again. We're told that Abraham and his forefathers served pagan gods over there in Mesopotamia. So God enters again into the affairs of men and chooses one man and then builds a whole nation through them. And, of course, they apostatize, and then he chooses one man out of the nation of Israel, and that's Jesus Christ, to finish his mission. And then, of course, he raises up the church, and the church apostatizes on God and falls away. In hundreds of years, they were in what we call the Dark Ages. And what's he doing? He's doing, again, what he's done continually, and that is to intervene in the affairs of history and mankind again. So, hallelujah. so that's a quick summary of all of history because all of history is like a yo-yo we're down most of the time until God brings us back up again but we're down most of the time and then he reaches in and deals with a certain people in a certain place and does something with them and you see he's dealing with us today but guess what's right after us tribulation period and during the tribulation period like never before revelation 6 says that even in the midst of all of their curses which they're going to know has come from god they're going to blaspheme god when they know it's god who's the one bringing all the curses upon them and then he's going to save revelation 7 
a whole multitude out of tribulation. Is that going to affect everyone else? No, because then after the first three and a half years, we're going to have what he calls in Matthew 24, the last three and a half years known as the great tribulation. And so afterwards, you say, everyone's saved. Well, we enter into a great period of the millennium, but guess what happens after the millennium? <laughs> Gog and Magog, and all the nations gather together. Satan, remember, is loosed out of the pit. This is Revelation chapter 20, gathers Gog and Magog together to fight against the beloved city. It happens time and time and time again. And it's not until after that, finally... Of course, the devil is thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. There's the great white throne judgment where death and Hades deliver up their dead, and all of those people are thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death or eternal death. And not until then do we get to the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, which says that there will be a city where there will not dwell any unrighteousness or any iniquity. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13 speaks of the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. We've never had an earth except prior to the fall wherein dwelleth righteousness. It's always a little righteousness and then down they go and righteousness again and then down they go. This is why God many times has to use revivals because it gets people revived and saved and hungry for more of God. And so we had in this country the first and the second great awakening. But we need an awakening just about every year nowadays. Amen. We had one a century back in the 18th century. <laughs> but they don't last. I mean, the days of Finney and Moody are 100 years behind us now. Amen. See, during the days of Finney and Moody, we had a great awakening in the New England states, in this country, in the Ohio River Valley states. But that's been 100 years ago. Wow. And we could use an awakening just about every time we wake up in the morning. Amen. I mean, we're supposed to be doing that personally and individually, but I mean in the whole church because everything is going downhill, downhill, downhill. And God just steps in for a moment and brings us back up and then, of course, lets us go on our own again to do what he's told us to do, and there we go again. He has to hold our hand all the time. And here man, that's why we read Psalm 14. Here man thinks he's so intelligent, so brilliant, we can't make it through the door without stumbling if God doesn't hold our hand. Yeah, we always want to boast about me, 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 I, I, what we can do. The accomplishments of humanistic man. We can't even make it over the threshold without him holding our hand or we just stumble and fall flat on our face. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the Bible says. Those that always recognize their need of God, they can't do anything if he doesn't hold your hand while you do it. Amen. I'm not confessing that we all ought to confess that we're always weak all the time. But weakness isn't the same as saying that God's holding my hand in whatever I do. That's strength right there. That's certainly not weakness. If anything, that's strength. It's another thing for a person to always confess they're no good and rotten and so forth. The Bible doesn't say that about you. The Bible says you're a new creation. So if you're going to say something about yourself, say what the Bible says. But we don't get to any blessed, glorious time until the very end of the Bible, 21, 22 of the book of Revelation. That's why the Bible is put together in the way that God intended for it to be put together from Genesis to Revelation, for us to see this continual falling away of man and lifting up of God and the intervening of God into the affairs of mankind. So you say, well, how does his intervening help here how is it manifested well it's manifested in verses 6 through 9 very interestingly enough by the fact that God's covenant name is used I believe four times rather than the more general name of Elohim he's using his name Yahweh and Yahweh is his saving covenantal name and so he's using this name to show that he's concerned about man and rather than just leave man in all of his wickedness, he knows that nothing good is going to come out of this conglomeration of unity and occult knowledge. And since he knows that nothing good is going to come out of it, he really, for the benefit of man, intervenes. And of course, we end up with the results of verses 7, 8, and 9. 
So when he says here in verse uh, 6, Behold, the people is one, they have all one language. This they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Well, what are they imagining to do? Gain all types of knowledge and understanding about false things that God doesn't intend for them to, to understand more about astrology, the stars, the planets, demons, and devil worship. That's what they're imagining to do. The typical person thinks they're imagining to try to actually get into heaven. But as we showed you from verse 4, whenever you take the may reach out, that strikes that theory out because they're already in heaven as far as they're concerned. They're not trying to get to heaven. They are rebelling against God. That's what the very name Nimrod means is the rebellious one. And his comrades are rebellious just as he is. So what they're imagining to do is to gain a greater allegiance with the devil and the kingdom of darkness. And God, rather than leaving them in their sin, and then, of course, shortly thereafter, having to destroy the world, then we have uh, verse 7 where he says, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So verses 5, 6, and 7 give us God's reaction. His reaction is really one out of love and long-suffering for humanity. Rather than destroying them, as he did back in chapter 6 with the flood, he's long-suffering, going to give them another opportunity, another chance. So in verses 8 and 9, we gave you a little outline uh, a few weeks ago, I believe. 8 and 9 give us the result of God's reaction of the divine awareness that we find here. God becomes aware of what they're doing, anthropomorphically speaking, and then there are some results that come from the result of their actions, and that, of course, was God's awareness. We've got several results that come from this. Here in verse 9, we see the name of the city mentioned for the first time, Babel. First time, that is, here in this chapter. Remember, it's been mentioned in 1010. Now, the name originally was a Babylonian name, which meant the gate of God. Now the Hebrews just changed it a little bit and ended up with this word Babel, which of course to them meant confusion. But the original word for the Babylonians, the way it's still used in some places, refers to the city and its name being the gate of God or the gate of heaven rather than confusion. Of course, it was named confusion because of the linguistic result that transpires here in verses 8 and 9. So we want to come with what time we've got here to at least the first of these results that we have. The two most important things that stand out here in chapter 11 are the Tower of Babel and the confusion of tongues. I mean, if you think of Genesis 11, those are the two things you think of, the Tower of Babel and the confusion of tongues. Neither one of these phrases happens to be a biblical phrase, although the idea is biblically oriented because it's found here in chapter 11. But it's the popular phrase that's used to refer either to this tower, the Tower of Babel, or to at least one of the results, and generally that's the only result you ever hear about is one of these, and that is what we call the confusion of tongues. Now we're going to go ahead and leave it with that designation because, well, that's exactly what happens here is he confuses the language of the people. So we'll stay with the popular reference to the Tower of Babel and to the confusion of tongues. But... That's not so simple just to say that we'll stay with the confusion of tongues because what was the confusion of tongues? Let's look at several views held by different people in different places on what the confusion of tongues really was. Now maybe off the top of your head you think that you just know automatically what it was and maybe you do. I'm not saying that you don't. It's really not that difficult if you just read the verses here. But there are a lot of other views concerning what is meant here by the Mosaic statement of the confounding of their language in verse 7 and in verse 9. You see, by the way, it's not even called confusion. It's called the confounding of their language, but it means the same thing. 
So in the first place, one view, which is the most popular view, is that all we have here is a myth that's being recorded by Moses to help explain to people of his day the various languages that were contemporary with him and with them. You say, well, what makes that the popular, most prevalent view? Well, if you remember anything we've taught earlier, all of Genesis 1 to 11 is nothing but a myth as far as most people are concerned, even some people that would be in an evangelical church or in an evangelical background. When you talk about a literal creation week, I mean, we can go right back to creation and go through all that we went through there of six literal 24-hour consecutive days. I mean, you've got to get all of it in there. Six literal 24-hour consecutive days. What evangelical holds to that? Well, you're not going to find many. We gave you some writings from E.J. Young's son, who E.J. Young was a famous Old Testament scholar. Davis Young now, his son who's alive, E.J. died in 1968, who is a, quote, Christian geologist, unquote, is continually writing books. I think he's got two out now. And any time anyone writes a book in favor of the Genesis 1 position, then he enters his little critique in the back of someone's journal in a book review about that particular book, why he can prove from geology and from the Bible, but geology first, notice, that's where he puts his faith and trust, that the six days there, although they might possibly be literal, maybe even 24 hour, aren't consecutive. Or if they're consecutive, then they're not literal or 24 hour. You see, you can have it either way, according to them. That way, you could end up with six literal 24 hour days, but in between each day, two million years. Or, if you go the other way and make them uh, consecutive days, then you've got six days, but the day really is two million years. So either way you go, you end up with geology evolutionary theory, whether it's atheistic or theistic evolution. Who believes anything about a universal flood, a literal Noah that really got all the animals into the ark? That's why I'm saying this is a myth. And of course, the greatest myth is right here in chapter 11, a tower of Babel, and all these people all of a sudden started speaking other languages. Well, that certainly couldn't have happened. All he's trying to do is somehow explain with a myth how he ended up in the time of Moses with all the languages that they had. You need to remind them that practically all of these 11 chapters are found practically throughout the New Testament and they are endorsed as well as their, quote, fictitious, superstitious accounts, unquote, by Jesus and by the apostolic writers. They talk about Adam and Eve as though Adam was a real man. I mean, you'd get that impression that he was a real man, not an ape, and that he was the first man for any pre-Adamic theorists that are around, and there are many of those around today. 1 Corinthians 15 calls him the first man, Adam, and that Eve, really, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, talked to a snake, and the snake talked back to her. That's more than even evangelicals can swallow. And you see what they do with this, and unless you had been taught, wherever you've been taught, whether you got it here or maybe before you ever came here, unless you'd been taught a strong view of the inspiration of Scripture, then that's the easy back door of escape to adopt and just say, well, yeah, he didn't mean a snake. He was just, by symbolism, trying to get across the point to it. I mean, it's pretty hard to swallow the fact, unless you believe the whole Bible and know something about the Bible, that a snake could have talked back then, and that Noah could have built an ark and put all the animals, that there could have been enough water. You see, we happen to have done enough study to see how these things could have taken place, and most people haven't, but how there could have been enough water to cover the whole globe, even all the high mountains. Mount Everest, 29,000 feet. Yeah. Wouldn't have had any oxygen up there, not enough water but to cover, and on and on and on. Well, you ought to know the answers to all that now. And what about chapter 11 when we get here? A tower of Babel and these people building this and saying that they're actually going to get into heaven and they all started talking different languages. It's a myth to explain the languages of Moses' day. 
Well, a second view, that's the most popular view. A second view is that what he's doing here is simply expressing the culmination. You could probably hear the word evolution somewhere in here, though I won't say it. Expressing the culmination of thousands of years, perhaps millions, of gradual linguistic change. In other words, the writer here is not attributing direct, but rather immediate efficiency to God, which many times is done in Scripture. It says God did something, but it didn't really mean that he did it. He used some other natural process to do whatever it, it said that he did. And so when it says here God changed their languages, it's the same, dear friends, as the day-age theory. You see there it says that God made these things, and they say what that means is, oh, God did it, but he did it by thousands and millions of years, kind of a gradual process where really things made themselves is what you end up with. Well, the same thing is being said here. There wasn't any drastic immediate things. They don't like drastic immediate things for some reason. As though the resurrection of Jesus Christ wasn't something drastic and something immediate. If we start trying to draw everything out to thousands of years, then maybe he's still in the tomb. They're always trying to work these things out so we can have enough time for maybe a spider to get in there and pinch the right nerve and he comes out of the coma. Or for something strange to happen, but let's don't let God immediately do any of these things, just immediately do whatever it is that he's done. And so this is, again, another popular view that's held by the evolutionists that if anything's being expressed here, it's just the culmination. We finally get to different languages after thousands upon thousands of years. Another view is that what's being expressed here is the loss or suspension of articulate speech. Everyone, in other words, became dumb. And since you couldn't communicate very well that way, that served the purpose of stopping the construction of the city. Remember, the tower's already been built. But verse 8 says the city has not yet been completed. Then another view is that when God scattered the people, then they became so distant from one another that they lost contact, and therefore the dialects and pronunciations changed. Oh, that's, that sounds, well, pretty good. Not as bad as some of the other ones. It's pretty good there. Only problem with that is he changed the language before they got scattered. <laughs> They've got things just backwards here. They're putting the scattering before the confounding, and the Bible puts the confounding before the scattering. So that theory won't work. Another theory, and why they adopt this one rather than the biblical one, because they're really a similar thing except they're just the reverse, is that God changed the hearing ability of everyone. <laughs> Man will go to such extents to get around the word. I mean, it's still a miracle if you changed everyone's hearing so that they heard that they were speaking, that someone was speaking another language when they really weren't. It's still a miracle. <laughs> why not just believe the Bible? They do the same thing in Acts 2 by saying no one spoke in tongues, people heard tongues. It's still a miracle, though. So why not just leave it to speaking in tongues? Then, of course, the final and biblical view is that the speaking ability was changed by means of different languages and dialects given to the people. So in the question of the well, of the deprivation of comprehension versus the deprivation of expression, of course, the latter would have to come first because it comes first here in Scripture, that it was the speech that was changed, and then after the speech was changed, you didn't have to change their hearing. That was already taken care of by changing the other person's speech. Really, they're trying to work too many miracles for us in here. All we need is one miracle. That's the changing of the speech, not of the hearing. But they complain about how tremendous of a miracle this really would have been. But I want to give you a couple of scriptures to show you what God can do. For instance, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? 
Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? In other words, he's got all the power that he needs to do any type of changing that needs to be changed. And then Numbers chapter 22 and verse 28. People stumble over this, that it would have been too great of a philological, biological, psychological miracle. Well, how about Numbers 22, 28, and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. <laughs> And she said unto Balaam, She must have been a good her there. What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And goes on reasoning with Balaam here. Because Balaam makes his comment in verse 29, and the ass said right back to Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. This is a rather intelligent beast here that's actually able to communicate. I mean, a question and answer. It wasn't that just, you know, God took over the tongue and forced some words out. The ass spoke, listened to the response, and gave an intelligent response back. Now, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is then. It is told to us over in 2 Peter 2.16 that God made the dumb ass to speak with a man's voice forbidding the madness of the prophet. That's in Second Peter. And actually says that he made him to speak with a man's voice. Well, of course, we would understand a person's voice because the ass happened to be a female, so it couldn't have been a man's voice or have been a strange voice. But nevertheless, a voice still came out. Man many times simply means person. As a matter of fact, that's really what the word means. It's just translated man many times in Scripture. So anyway... There's really not too much of a problem with the speaking ability here in chapter 11. That, of course, is assuming that you believe Numbers 22 and verse 28. And, of course, if you don't believe this, you probably won't believe Numbers 22, 28. But we've got plenty of text to show that God can change languages. One final one that we want to come back to this again next week is Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And we all have that personal experience of how he can give languages supernaturally. Now, a charismatic Christian wouldn't appreciate that example. But, but we, of course, appreciate it. I mean in more ways than one. We appreciate it in that we understand what's meant by it, and we appreciate it because we're glad we've got it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.